said that um, he will talk about. I know a lot of things. I can't remember the two things. Anyway, you're free to ask any questions, right? Yes. Uh, all right. So we'll do the second one. Good morning, everybody. I'm David Dahl. I was kind of thinking about this morning. You know, it's been 10 years I've been participating in these meetings, so it's nice to see the, a lot of familiar faces, and it's nice to see the group growing as well. So um, thanks for the continual support. So as Marcia mentioned, I am the Treatment Ophthalmology Advisor up at Merced, and uh, it's been uh, nice to have May on board. Started about almost two years ago, I think now, and then Phoebe Gordon just started up in Madera County. So we got some new blood into the ranks. Hopefully, we'll, you guys will work with them and, and keep them learning. So to begin with, uh, I'm going to cover pest management. I'm going to cover fungicides, and then probably a grab bag of uh, topics kind of after that. So just to bring up and some pointers to remember. They gave me an hour. I think you're going to get a deal on that. Um, at least in regards to DPR, as long as they're not here to audit. Otherwise, I'll talk for an hour. Uh, so, first off, uh, bees. Get them out of your orchards. I see a lot of bees still in the orchards. Once you get into the majority of petal fall, the bees aren't doing you much good. Waiting until they fertilize or potentially pollinate every last flower is really just having those hives get in the way of operations. Um, I had a, a person email me saying, hey, I need to spray an insecticide, but I got my bees in the orchard, what should I do? I said, get the bees out of the orchard. That's the first thing you should do. So why? Um, at this point, bees are only pulling nectar out of the flowers. Nectar is sugar. And the sugar is, is carbohydrate that's coming out of the reserves of the tree. So they're not pulling pollen anymore. They're not doing any type of pollination or fertilization. They're just pulling resources from the tree. And in many cases, these bees kind of get left within the field because the beekeeper doesn't want to pull them out. So either it's your friend who's a beekeeper and that's okay, but if it's not your friend, you pay for those bees to do one job, and that job is to pollinate, and you want to get them out as soon as you can so you don't get the blame spraying with pesticides. Put it at that. Why do I mention that? Um, a couple people were asking about uh, leaf banded leaf rollers, or essentially leaf rollers. Uh, where you want to make applications of, of pesticides on these early uh, developing nuts. It's kind of a rare problem, but if it does happen and you have bees in the way, it's hard to spray Altacor or Intrepid or in those applications and you're stuck with the use of BT or Bacillus, to help, 30 Ingensis to help with that. All right, so that's the first point I want to bring up because I still see a lot of bees in the field. Uh, a lot of beekeepers would tell you that they want to get them out anyway, so just call them and get them removed. Uh, traps need to be out in the fields uh, by the middle of March. Usually we target March 15th. This is for both peach tree borer as well as egg traps for navel orange worm. Um, there's a lot of concern about navel orange worm male and female traps, but I'll get to that in a minute. It's been cool and wet since the 15th. If you're missed a bye week, no big deal. When you get weather like this, where we've got another storm coming in next week, your counts are going to be all over the place, and it's going to be hard to establish a biofix until the weather gets consistent. Uh, so get them out as soon as you can. And why they're important is for establishing those points, what we call a biofix. A biofix is when um, it's the start of the overwintering population emerging into adulthood. So that point allows us to determine when the time sprays later down the road. Biofix is when two of your traps within a field show capture. So if it's a PTB moth trap, that means you caught one moth in both traps are more than one moth in both traps. Both traps have to light up if you have only two. If you have more than that, it's when you have two or more within the field showing that. Uh, same thing with navel orange from egg traps. Once you get both of those egg traps lighting up, that's an indication that you have an established biofix. Generally, we like to see at least two traps per field, but one trap for every 20 acres for larger parcels. So minimum two traps, but as you get bigger, you only need an additional trap for every 20 acres. Uh, peach tree borer, once you have a biofix, you're looking at about uh, three to 400 degree days um, to make that first application, and that's your spring spray. Um, so why do I mention peach tree borer? We used to control this a lot with bloom sprays. Uh, people used to use a lot of Dimlin through bloom, and that did a nice job of controlling peach tree borer. 
but recently, since we've been pulling those products out of bloom spray for the safety of the bees, we're having increasing issues with peach tree borer if it's not being monitored for. Um, so in that case, uh, you're looking at that three to 400 degree day timing. It usually comes late April, early May, sometimes the first week of May, depending on how, what temperatures it is. Uh, we are looking, when we look at the uh, degree day timing, um, you're looking at the temperatures between 50 and 85. It's kind of a confusing model. It's on the IPM website. Just web search UC IPM, it'll pop up. With navel orange worm, we're looking at 100 degree days past the biofix. And you're thinking, well, wait a minute, why is such a difference? They're later, they're later emerging. So by the time those traps light up, it's going to be a little bit further down the road. And often that 100 degree days past egg laying is going to put you somewhere around the beginning to the middle of May. Some years, PTB and navel orange worm match up really well, and a single spring spray can knock them both back. Sometimes not. The question is, do we need this spring spray for navel orange worm? That's always a, an important point, and a lot of that's going to be tied down to how, tr how much you trust your winter sanitation program. If you did an excellent job, and you don't have a lot of mummies in your trees, and your neighbors don't have a lot of mummies in their trees because you guys did a good job working together to clean up everything, spring spray isn't probably going to get you too much. But if you have a lot of population coming in and you have a lot of mummies, you probably will have value. Why do spring sprays work? And this is why I bring that up. Spring sprays treat the mummy nuts. That's it. You're spraying the tree to treat the mummy nuts because the only thing the navel orange worm is eating is the mummy nut. So the, the female lays her eggs on those mummies. The egg hatches and begins to crawl around trying to find a source of protein. It's only feeding on that mummy. So again, good sanitation usually means you're not going to have much value from a spring spray. I had a couple questions regarding male traps versus egg traps. Uh, this is for navel orange worm. This is for the PCAs in the group. A lot of people are looking at these male pheromone-based traps and using that uh, to help try to get an understanding of population. That is exactly what it is. It gives you an idea of population. We have not been able to determine spray timings based on male capture traps at this point. So you still need to have your egg traps out and it gives you they give you an idea of when to spray, but the male traps give you an idea of that population. So if, um, why I mention that is because populations can be high and egg trap counts may be really, really, really low. So the way to think about it, I think Joel Siegel said this best, a USDA researcher saying that only dumb females lay eggs on a, a, an egg trap. It's a piece of black plastic with ground up almond meals in it, or almond meal in it. So it's a very unattractive lure and it's somewhere has the affinity or the resolution of like 0.001%. So it's not very effective in detecting populations. It's just trying to tell you when they're beginning to lay eggs. Uh, a lot of concern, or a lot of questions about mating disruption um, as well. A lot of people are interested in putting up uh, mating disruption, and I would say yes. If you, had, uh, if you had an issue with navel orange worm and you want to pursue it, especially if you're around pistachios or other big blocks, uh, mating disruption, essentially, it's, a, it's what we're doing is we're putting out the female pheromone to confuse the heck out of the male so he can't find the female. And that means the female's not fertilized and she can't lay eggs that will hatch into a larva. It's that simple. Works relatively well in larger parcels because of how you have the, the, the emittance of this stuff through these different puffer systems that spray a little bit of pheromone into the air on different timings. And uh, when you have a larger field, you have less edge effect. Because as you can imagine, you get these trails of pheromone going across the field and you have an issue on your edges that you tend to have more missed areas. So from an area-wide perspective, our, our larger blocks, so in that case I'm talking 40, 50 acres or greater, you have a lot of, you could have a potential lot of benefit from mating disruption. On smaller 10, 15, 20 acre parcels, you need a lot more pheromone dispensers around your edges in order to make sure that you don't have gaps in your protection. So it's a little bit trickier in those cases. I bring that up because that should be evaluated when, if you're thinking about this or not, because they're expensive. They're running anywhere from 115 to 130 dollars an acre. And there's three different systems out there, and they all, from our studies, work about the same. So uh, some have more trap spray acres, some have less. 
It's just price point and comfort and the service contract associated with those maiden soil dispensers. All right, that covered my insect spiel. Oh, mites, I forgot about mites. Don't spray them too early. And that's the take home message. The earlier you spray mites, the more problems you will have later on. More and more data is showing that. When you have those, those guys crawling up out of the tree in the spring and you get nervous and you want to go through and blast them, let those go. Those are going to be food for your predators, which will help suppress your late spring season mites. We're finding a strong correlation to the earlier we spray ab abamectin, the earlier it breaks down and the larger the mite problem we have at harvest. So this idea of spraying abamectin before the leaves get hard and they need to put it on in early April, you're actually shooting yourself in the foot. You're killing the food that your predators will feed on, as well as abamectin is a great product in killing six spotted fruits, which has become our predominant predator of mites in the San Joaquin Valley. So sp spray that, I'm not saying not to spray it, but spray it properly timed. If you need to make a miticide application, <coughs> that's gonna come when you're getting, uh, when you're doing your presence absence sampling, or PCA is doing presence absence sampling to determine when it's done. Do you have a question? Maybe. Maybe. So, a lot of people will throw it in in the May spray. I think when I started, I used to hear this AAA May spray, bound, sale, you know, sale, and, and abamectin. But I'd say at the very earliest, you're looking, you know, the first two weeks of May. Granted, it should be population based, and there's cases where we've been actually deferring the, the May spray um, all the way through to all split. Um, just because we have predators that are taking care of the project. And that's from Kern County up to Merced. So this isn't just in Merced, this is in Kern County as well, that these populations will build, they'll build, they'll build, and then the predators will move in and clean them up. But you have to be monitoring that. That's not, if, if you're not gonna monitor it, I'd probably say you, you're probably looking at mid-May um, as the timing you wanna put on. Not, not these mid-April, late-April things because of the season's advance and leaf hardening's occurring. Put it out a little bit later, and hold a little longer. So, what's your strategy if you got leaf in the bug? Yeah, so so that's a, that's a big point. So, um, leaf footed bug is we don't know. That is kind of always the wild card in this. Um, why I say it's a wild card because we do know. I'll get to that in a minute, Sarah. So, we do know that you can actually get away with spraying miticides in these fields if you're able to use soft chemistries through the season. The problem is, is you have these wild cards. So one, pyrethroids are super cheap. And then, uh, so it makes an, a, a nice alternative when you're, instead of forking out 30 to $35 an acre for Alticor or Intrepid, you're forking out five to $8 an acre for a sale or who knows what. Um, by Venture, Warrior, Brigade, on and on. And so when you're getting to those hull split sprays, that actually gives you this, this cheaper application to come into. The problem is, is when you make that hull split spray with pyrethroid, you're gonna feel it all the way in through the next year. And we find that those, those pyrethroids, actually, pyrethroids will persist on that tree for over half, six months and actually reduce your predator mite populations on those trees. So it actually can impact your predators feeding on the mites and cause flare-ups the following season. That is then further excavated by a leaf footed plant pod. So when you guys are trying to battle that thing, you're either using an OP, which is getting harder to use, lower spans getting harder to use, or using a pyrethroid. And the pyrethroid will flare mites later on in the season, and in that case you probably need to put in some type of a miticide to help hold that tree through the season <coughs> in the whole split. So in that case, I would say, yeah, if you're going to be making that spray with the pyrethroid, you are going to be coming back, either tank mixing it in, are coming back in a couple weeks later um, to hit it um, again with that product. I would usually have a mectin type product. Um, there's been some good luck though working with, and this is a little bit out of my ballpark, so I'll, I know that we well, there's some things up on the website, the Mom and Doctor website, but David ha Havlin has been showing some good work with some of these growth regulator mitocytes. And um, so if you're looking to get away from having mectin, there are some alternatives out there. Okay, any other questions? What's stink bug? So, uh, most of the cases we're worried more about uh, leaf footed plant bug because it has a longer style and it can actually pierce into the nut and kill it. Stink bug can, stink bug can be a problem. Um, we're worried about brown, brown marble rated stink bug, but it's one of these things that seems to be coming into the orchards a little bit later in the season. 
Um, tell you the truth, we don't really know what to do yet. Uh, with brown marble rated stink bug. We don't know the proper timings. We don't know uh, when the nut is resistant or, or susceptible to <coughs> So I would probably say at this point, stay tuned. Um, we know like with green shoulder stink bug and those other ones, they can be problematic, uh, but they tend to be problematic in very localized areas. So if you have them, you got to blast them. That's the only thing you have. It's pyrethroid. Um, we don't have a lot of broad spectrum insecticides that do anything, or we don't have a lot of broad spectrum insecticides. And then the compound that there's not a lot of insecticides that are effective on true bugs. So that's your your stink bugs, Brumara stink bug, your leaf footed plant bug. Those guys, they're they're like little tanks out there, and they're really hard to kill. Um, so you're you're really looking at a pyrethroid or maybe um, a neonic if, if possible. So that brown marmorated stink bug is here. In uh, May. I I don't know. I, I know it has been detected up in Modesto. And with Merced. We've also found some last year. So I would imagine that it's here. They are. Yeah. It's just who knows what they're going to do. We've actually been shocked by how slow they've been spreading in the San Joaquin Valley. So we don't know if it's a heat factor or what, but they just don't seem to be doing as well as we expected. <laughs> What I mean, that, that's a negative component when I say that. Um, they're not doing as well as we expected compared to what we learned from the Sacramento Valley. I'd say if you're dealing with peaches, it's a much more severe of an issue, or fresh fruit. And almonds, we're still trying to figure out exactly the right timing that we need to protect. But you hear horror stories back east, you know. Oh yeah, and, and rightfully so. It's, it's, it is an animal. Um, Essentially, start writing them out of the window in, in a lot of those crops. So, um, the little bit more into uh, moving on. I know we're dealing with some rain this week. Rain is um, through the next couple of days, and then rain on the weekend. It looks like another front's going to be coming through. Although we like the fact we're getting rain, and we like the fact we're seeing the snow level drops. The snow levels drop with these next coming storms. It does create a little bit of an issue when we're dealing with um, spray timings with fungicides. So we just kind of pulled out a bloom, which is one of our more susceptible timing of these trees. We're now moving into this post petal fall period. So I gave you guys all just a quick printout from our efficacy, fungicide efficacy tables. And on the back side is the optimal spray timing for different diseases. So the good thing is, is we're, we're through brown rot period. We're relatively through um, jacket rot. We're now moving into what remains of a little bit of shot hole, a little bit of anthracnose, and we can still get a little bit of green fruit rot. So those three are the major diseases we're worried about right now. In another couple weeks, our scab timing will open up. But we get 10 to 14 days with the fungicide. So if you made an application and you don't want to see disease, you got 10 to 14 days with rain. If it rains hard, like this three-day event, you probably have closer to 10 days. Um, it takes about anywhere from 45 minutes to an hour for a fungicide to be rain fast. So depending on the product, uh, so I plan for an hour. In that case, uh, trying to get, if you need to make something before rain, let it dry for an hour before the rain hits the ground. Um, so why I bring all that up is because I keep seeing um, either we do a poor job of selecting what we're spraying at puddle ball or we're not getting good enough coverage, but we're getting more and more jacket rot our green fruit rot that keeps popping up, and that's this botrytis fungus that we don't do a very good job of controlling with the strobularin, which is a gem or a bound, or the DMI group, which is your propoconazole, so probocure, bumper, till, uh, there's a whole slug of them. So that's your FRAC 11 and your FRAC 3, which means quadristyle, which is a blend of those two, doesn't do a very good job of controlling it either. So keep that in mind as if you if you're trying to manage and we're getting to these long periods of wet, we need to make sure we have something protecting the <coughs> fruit rot. So you're really looking at a FRAC 7, which is like Fontellus, um, or something that contains a FRAC 7, so that's the very loop, like Fluopyram, the Luna products, our Marathon, Pristine, and so forth. So um, I'm a big fan of tank mixing. So you actually take the two products and you mix them together. But I know. Uh, a lot of farmers are telling me that's more bottles they got to handle and more errors that can happen. But the reason I like that is because you can put the high rate of both fungicides in and get a better kill. 
versus when you look at these premixed products, they're always at the lower label rate for each of the respective chemistries. So, and also it tends to be the same price if you go at the high rate with two or the low rate with a combo product. Um, so keep that in mind. There is some potential there that uh, you can do some of this mixing on your own. And I say that because the frac free group um, bumper tail flush, you're looking at five to seven dollars an acre. And with uh, Fontellus as a single mode of action of a seven, you're looking at like 20 to 25. So if you make that mix on your own, you're creating your own Luna experience, which is probably something at the same price point, and you get a higher dose of the active ingredient. Not the point of finger anything, but just to let you know the, the discrepancies between the two of those. Uh, once we get through this rainy period and we get into that two to five or that three to five week period post petal fall, scab time. Scab, scab, scab. You got Carmel, you probably had scab in the past. If you haven't treated it dormant with chlorothalonil, make sure you get something on. And then last but not least, don't forget rust. And rust is something we'll have to spray monthly, at least through probably the beginning of June if you have severe issues with it. And it seems like it's becoming more and more of an issue just because of the increasing footprint of almonds. So um, the one thing about rust is you don't need to use anything high dollar. Use the cheapest fungicide you can find. It, it, you can control it with sulfur. So, I mean, it's, it's not a hard one to prevent, or not a hard one to manage. You just have to have the spray on to prevent the leaves from infection. And that's the trick with, with rust. So, you know, a May spray does a nice, if you're doing, running something in in May, putting in a fungicide for rust will do the trick. And usually if that's a mid to late May, that should hold the trees long enough to where you'll get a little bit of rust showing up in September, October, but that's okay. A little bit of disease is okay. It's just we don't want to defoliate in September. So that's what we're trying to prevent. Um, do to do. Other than that, that's kind of all I had to do run through today. Um, yes, sir. What's the uh, severity of the uh, trees damage from Sacramento Valley? <laughs> oh boy, that's a million dollar question. I should have known that was going to happen. So the severity of so uh, we, you know, I, I'm, I'm trying to get an accurate an accurate feel, but um, from what I'm gathering, it's probably around forty percent up in the Sac Valley. I don't know, anybody else hearing anything different? When you say 40%, you know, what is it, 20-25% of the flowers actually are potentially, so you're talking about 40% of the flowers that bloomed on the trees, maybe, so now you have 60 flowers that maybe have the potential to make 20-25? Yeah, yeah. We don't know. We don't know. It's early to tell the damage, but they got hit hard. So the Sac Valley was actually ahead of us. So it was. Th this is a weird bloom year. We saw the Sac Valley go first, and then it kind of creeped up from Bakersfield to the San Joaquin Valley. And just Merced, north of here, we were one of the last places to bloom. I couldn't believe it. It was actually a little bit shocking. Um, but when that freeze event came in, those guys, they were, they were full out, and they got hit pretty hard. Many of them got hit pretty hard. And so that's what I, I'm thinking on that, Barrett, to ask that as, is, yeah, I think they're looking probably around 40% reduction up there. But I don't know. But that's kind of what I'm guessing. We won't know for another couple weeks. My, so you guys want to know probably why this, you know, one, we had that real hot January. So it pushed the trees. And then you got that real cold snap. And you notice how long these flowers stopped? Like it just stopped the progression of bloom. Remember, everything in the spring is tied to heat. So when you get a really warm spring, after chill accumulation occurs, it's all about accumulating heat. So the warmer it is, the faster the trees begin to progress. And when they start, they push, and that's due to both the flow, the actually they begin to pull up a little bit more water, and, and the juices start to move, the nitrogen starts to move, the carbohydrates moving, and that's why you get that progression with heat. And then once it drops, once the temperature drops, the trees just stop. And it's a way to kind of naturally come into balance with, with the changing temperatures. So that's why you kind of saw that really long tail, real quick ramp up, and then a really long tail to bloom. It's because of those cold temperatures that followed that freeze event, just kept these trees there. So what does that mean? Couldn't tell it. Um, but generally speaking, those late blooming flowers are the weaker ones on the tree. So they don't usually set at a very high percentage. 
And, and so when you lose your first flowers that's to a frost event, that hurts the most. Um, and the tree will maybe compensate with a higher, slightly higher set percentage of the remaining flowers, but I'd say it's a very mild compensation at best. This idea that you're gonna lose 40% of your flowers and still have 80% of the crop, no, no. Maybe you're lucky you'll get 63% of the crop or 64% of the crop. And then you have the, comp the component where you have a slightly larger kernel size associated with that. So you might come out to be around 66 to 67 percent of, of what you're expecting. So this idea that these trees are going to super compensate, eh, sorry, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but um, you know, it's just, it's just the way it is. So what you're saying is it wasn't a normal bloom before the frost. So like the non paralysis they weren't blooming normally. So when the frost came, that just added to the problem. Yeah, so non were definitely weaker this year. Just because we had a, we had a pretty good year last year. So I was kind of expecting the non to be off this year, just based on when you look at the statewide average. So they were kind of coming in a little bit weaker. And then, yeah, of course, they got hit and probably going to lose a little bit more. Um, so yeah, that's that's kind of what, what I'm guessing. Um, I'm, I'm kind of. Not, I'm a little bit bearish on this, but we'll see how it all turns out in the season. But the nice thing is the price should compensate probably more so than the tree will compensate for the lost flowers. So that's there will probably be value in farming these unless you have a complete loss. So that's where May I think was was trying to hit on with the nitrogen management plan. You got to gear all this stuff back to help save a little bit of money, so you're not throwing a lot of money at a crop that's not there. So keep that in mind. Um, when you go into it. And you guys should know in a couple weeks. But I think generally east side of the San Joaquin Valley did get nipped in some spots, but we kind of did a little bit better than the Sacramento Valley. So that makes you feel a little bit better. And you guys out on the west side are probably way better off than, than everybody over here. So, um, yeah. Yes, sir. Are some trees more susceptible to frost than others? That's a really good question, and the answer, so the question was, are trees more susceptible to frost than others? Different varieties are more susceptible. The answer is yes, um, and it, there's, two, there's two components to this. One is, when you get further from dormancy, so as you break dormancy and you move to pink bud, pink bud, uh, you know, popcorn, and then into flowering, and then in, into the nutlet stage, you actually become more sensitive to, to freeze damage. So instead of being tolerant to 24, 25, or 20 to 22 at, at dormant bud, you're now at 24, 25 at pink bud, degrees Fahrenheit, 26, 27 at full bloom, 27, 28 at nutlet stage. So as you go through those stages, you increase your sensitivity. So varieties that open earlier in this year where you got that frost event come in were more prone to losses than varieties that were held back a little bit. So that's one aspect of it. And then two, just within, if you treat them all the same, there's differences in how varieties respond to frost damage. Uh, to give you an idea, at 25 degrees at full bloom, I'm trying to remember the chart in the back of my mind, non prel will have maybe a 20% crop loss um, at 30 minutes of that temperature based on studies, uh, while Price will have, or excuse me, Monterey will have like 30 or 40%. So there is some differences even at the same within the same stage. We don't really know why. Um, it may be something with the thickness of the jacket, the actual structure of the flower preventing it from those, those temperatures. Uh, that's that's probably somewhere along with the anatomy of it. It's not maybe it's probably not physiological. It's probably more the anatomy of, of the flower. Um, the other question I, I got yesterday or received yesterday was. Um, you know, what do we get with these different irrigation systems? Um, you do get some protection with just radiant heat when you have moist soil. So even if you flood it or you use your drip, you're gonna get a little bit of warmth. But that's, you're gonna get the biggest kick from anything that puts water into the air at around 30 to 35 gallons per acre per minute. So you need to have high water flows to get that heat into the canopy of the trees. Now saying you're not getting anything from the other ones, but it's just, you're gonna get the most from anything that puts water up into the air. 
And the idea is you want that water to freeze because as that sh it crystallizes and forms ice, it releases heat. And that's what you're trying to capture of it. You actually want that water to freeze and, and release heat into the tree. So, any other questions? Yes, sir. On top of uh, is it cold or are we not worried about it? I mean, you're trying to get nitrogen on, but everything's wet. So yeah, I mean, the, so there's there's two things. So phytophthora, you will run a risk in these colder springs, especially with the amount of water we put on with with bloom, with the frost protection, and then the amount of rains we're getting, and and that's the whole idea of holding off on, on getting these, the nitrogen on and the irrigation on. I, I really think we can put that a little bit on the back burner for a couple of weeks, um, and I'll give you some data on that why. But the night the recently is that the EU finally changed their MRL on the phosphonate products, so feel free to use those. Um, twice a year is still a recommendation from the UC, spring and fall at the most. Um, generally, you know, one application in the spring is pretty e effective, but two quarts of a uh, pretty high grade product applied at full leaf expansion um, in the spring and post harvest should help reduce phytophthora risk. Um, these cold wet soils Generally speaking, you know, yeah, there's an increased risk, but is it, I mean, widespread occurrence? I'd be more about wet feet than probably if I talk to her. Um, and kind of to add on what May said, just to give you guys an example of how long you could wait on putting out for, on, on water and fertilizer, we delayed a butte padre block to the 25th of April for the past three years of putting out any water and any fertilizer, and we didn't see any impact reduction of crop versus the, the grower standard. So you have time to get that fertilizer out a little bit later, or you can go in with the tag along if you want to put some fertilizer out now, or some or really short irrigation runs um, to get that product out. But generally these trees have enough nitrogen in their reserves from this fall. If your mid-July leaf tissue value is, is indicating a sufficiency level. So if you have mid-July tissue and it's sowing around 2.5%, you're putting a little bit on the post harvest. If you get these wet springs, you can hold back a little bit and, and not feel that you're under the gun to get the nitrogen out. We did that in comparison to the grower control and there's no difference. So just, that was actually a little bit of a controlled study. So, yes sir. Is whole rock more specific to certain varieties? Seems to be worse on our more vigorous varieties. So non-corral is, is pretty bad, but the worst one I've seen is super L. It just gets blasted with hull rot. Um, but I would add that with hull rot, um, variety susceptibility, of course, is, is one component, but usually I've been finding more and more it's because our nitrogen levels are too high. So guys, if we're starting to creep up in that mid-July above 2.5, back off on your nitrogen. Save a little bit of money. You don't need to have every, if you're properly sampling that, that leaf tissue. So that means you're taking non-fruiting spurs at head level from trees that are, you know, 100 feet apart across your field. And you're getting 20 to 25 trees in that sample. And you can feel very confident, 95 to 98% confident that all trees in the orchard are above that 2.5 level, which is the maximum of that sufficiency window. So when we get to 2.6, 2.7, 2.8, I just see hull rot go like this. It just goes up exponentially. So working to reduce the amount of nitrogen in those trees takes a while, and, but it's something that we can work on, and it really will help with hull rot. Um, don't believe me, believe, believe our, our Australian friends who were just blasted with hull rot five years ago until they realized they need to back off on their, their nitrogen applications. And, and the work down at Kern County showed the same thing. So the more nitrogen we put out, the more hull rot we get. What is the best future for the hull rot? Right now, this is actually, that's a good point. So um, a lot of people want to put out fungicides, but it looks like dipotassium phosphate, DKP, as an, alkal, as an alkaline treatment seems to be, at this point, made as a nutrient spray during hull split, uh, seems to be uh, doing a nice job of reducing the movement of the acid produced by <coughs> Um, all of the hull rot pathogens. So DKP looks pretty good. Uh, and that's some work that Jim Maniscavish has been doing. So that's dipotassium phosphate. It's a liquid foliar fertilizer product that's being sold. He started off working with different limes and, 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 and alkaline treatments or alkaline, alkalinization treatments. 
but uh, it looks like just due to the tank compatibility of dipotassium phosphate, it, it looks pretty good. That's good. Thanks for bringing that up. Um, that's been some recent work, so I'm pretty excited about that. Have you tried potassium bicarbonate? Uh, I think he has, uh, but I don't know the results right off the top of my head. Yeah. But yeah, and that's that's uh, so that really may mean we it doesn't actually reduce the infection of the nut. And you guys have to remember, hull rot. We don't care if it gets infected. We don't care if you have the black spores. It doesn't really do much damage to the kernel. What it does is it produces an a, a toxin that goes into the wood and kills the limb. So what these these treatments are doing is somehow it's preventing the movement or naturalizing neutralizing that toxin and preventing movement. So it's not necessarily about prevention. It's just about preventing the gumming, the stuck nuts, and the loss of the lower wood. So it looks, that looks promising. Um, would I put that, would I throw caution out the window and only rely on that treatment? Absolutely not. Um, but I definitely would give it a try if it's something I'm struggling with. <coughs> so remember, good water management through June. Trying to put a mild to moderate stress of, of level on those trees. We're not talking about wilting, we're just talking mild to moderate stress and trying to finish up our nitrogen applications uh, by the middle of May so that we, the tree can continue to pull that out as it goes into all split. That, those are the two, two practices alongside with, with fungicide sprays and other things. Um, if you want to put a fungicide in, uh, any of those frac 3s or frac 11s will do a trick on it. Single mode of action is what I've been using. Save a little bit of money. <coughs> How much does a copper spray uh, help? Uh, let's say you're on a full bloom uh, on almonds. How much does it help to control it, you know, or lessen the, the frost damage? Probably negligible. Um, there was some work done back in the 80s, and, and I might have misspoken on this on a comment on the website, um, but. Um, some work done in, back in the 80s by West Asai or 90s where he actually was trying to spray copper applications onto these trees to reduce, um, oh my mind just went blank, ice nucleating bacteria. Um, he was making weekly applications with copper and never found, never was able to document a significant effect in the field. They were hot, and that's mainly, he said, because we never got the freeze type of frost event that would say that would work or not. They have been able to show that it works in the lab, but we've never been able to document it in the field. And so I, I would probably, I'd probably say, I, I don't know if it's worth the risk of the phytotoxicity at bloom. Um, and you know, there's, there's a lot of these, some of these new products, like I think like FrostGuard, it's these ice nucleating, it tries to reduce or <coughs> beat the ice nucleating bacteria. So the idea of ice nucleating bacteria is it gives something for the water to freeze on. Um, excuse me, it prevents the water from freezing, right? And it allows the water to be super cool and enter the tissue and cause the plant to freeze. I think that's right. I might got it backwards. But long story short is um, we just haven't been able to find consistent results in almond just yet. And it's probably because of the sporadic events. So we haven't been able to get good, effective, and thorough testing. It's hard to go set these things up when you don't really know what to expect. Um, so I would say use with caution, but I don't think copper is a good good product to use at bloom. Any other questions? All right. It's done? All right. Thank you. Thank you much for your attention. I appreciate it.